so good to be here. Last time I was here, I had to run like a mile and a half, so that explains why I haven't been back. But uh, it's good to be here. My name is Paul McGinnis. I'm one of the pastors. I'm typically at our Clark Summit campus, but good to be with you. And whether you're here live with us or whether you're watching at our Dixon City campus or our Wilkes-Barre campus or online, so glad that we can spend this time together and excited for this new series. And I just want to introduce the series real quickly. You just saw that bumper video about Christmas at the movies. And so what we're going to do over the next four weeks is just mash together uh, two of my favorite pastimes. One is Christmas and the other is watching movies. And so now you get to do it on the weekend here at church. And so each of the next four weeks, we're going to take a, a classic, and I use that word loosely, and you'll see why in a minute, a, a mostly classic Christmas movie, and then kind of unpack that theme a little bit. Not really the movie itself, but what is it that makes that a powerful story? What is it about that that resonates with us? And, and how do we see some of those same themes in the scriptures and maybe even in the Christmas story itself? And so we're going to take a look at movies like uh, A Christmas Carol. And like It's a Wonderful Life, like uh, Home Alone, and probably the farthest from being a Christmas classic, but Mark Stenzi's guilty pleasure, the Will Ferrell movie Elf, you know, we, he found a way to edge that one into the mix. But we're going to begin today with It's a Wonderful Life. Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed, the classic movie. If you haven't seen it, you really should, and I, I hope I don't spoil too much of it for you today. A story about... Uh, about I just forgot his name. George Bailey, that's it. And George Bailey and the life that he lives. Now, just a, a quick little nugget that you may not have known before. Uh, Jimmy Stewart wasn't actually the first one originally cast for this role. In fact, we got some never-before-seen footage out of the vault of who was originally cast as the role of George Bailey. Take a look at this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Our very own Mark Stenzi was originally cast to play George Bailey, but... When his wife, Debbie, saw how lovingly he was looking at Donna Reed, he had to pull out, and uh, so Mark couldn't go on to do that, came to Parker Hill instead. But uh, just let that image burn into your minds there as we move on today. Mark Stenzi as George Bailey. But we're going to take a look at this story, and we're going to take a look at what happened in George Bailey's life. Right Here's a guy who lived his life for others, who lived a, a seemingly uh, mundane life, just going through life in Bedford Falls and, and leading his, his family company at, the, at the, uh, the loan, the home and loan store, the building and loan. And at one point in his life, he, he gets to a real low point. He's lost some money or his uncle has lost some money, and now things are really caving in on him. And he gets to a point where he's ready to take his own life. He's ready to, to just throw it all away. He's come to the conclusion that his life makes no difference, that his life doesn't matter, it's inconsequential, and, and it's not really worth much. And, and I fear that somewhere in there, you and I have been as well. We've felt similar things about our own life and the monotony and minutia of our lives, and we may have gone down this path that George Bailey goes down. And I want to take you to that scene in the movie where he's at his lowest point. And I want you to just, you know, draw up some of those memories for yourself of a time in your life where you may have had similar thoughts and feelings. And take a look at this scene from It's a Wonderful Life. So the other character there in that scene is Clarence, and he's, he's uh, George Bailey's guardian angel. And in that scene, as, as you just saw, he wishes he had never been born. And that's the turning point in the movie because from that point on, then George Bailey goes on to see what the world would be like if he hadn't been born and what Bedford Falls and that town and his family and all that. But he comes to this point, this moment that I fear you and I have been as well. And maybe some of you, I, I shudder to think, but maybe some of you have been to the point where you have maybe considered taking your own life. Hopefully you haven't gone that far down the path, but maybe you've gotten to the point where, boy, it just wouldn't have made any difference even if I wasn't born, right? The monotony of your life and just the routine of your life and seems inconsequential, seems like it's insignificant, right? Maybe you're a student and you're just slugging your way through one class after another, one project after the next, one exam onto the other, one semester and then the next, and just wondering, what, what's the point of all this? Do I need to keep doing this? Just wondering if your life makes any difference. Or maybe you've moved on from school and you're in a period of your life where, where you're working and, and your job may not be all that life-giving, may not be all that life-changing, but you're putting in 50, 60, 70 hours in that kind of work and you're wondering, what's the point? You know, why am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? Does my life, do these decisions, do my actions make any difference at all? 
Or maybe you're in a spot in life where you're giving round-the-clock care to someone who needs you. And yet they may not appreciate the level of your sacrifice. They may not appreciate all that you're giving to them throughout your sacrifice. And you just wonder, boy, what's the point? What's the use? And maybe that someone is nearing the end of their life, or maybe you're giving constant care to someone who's just beginning their life, right? And, and your days are filled with, with bottles and with diapers and with changing and with cleaning up and falling asleep and starting all over again the next day. And that's the routine of your life. And you wonder if that makes any difference, if there's any impact from your day-to-day existence. I'll tell you what, for, for my wife and I, as we have four kids, 10, 8, 5, and 2, You know, our life is pretty much the same each day. You know, wondering if anybody actually hears what we're saying, right? Because we just keep saying the same things over and over and wondering if we're making any difference, if we're we're molding these lives, you know, in any positive direction. It seems like we've gotten to the point where our, our sentences are never more than three words long, right? And those of you that are parents can relate with this, right? Hey, 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 what did I say? Yes, you will. Yes, we will. Yes, I will. Turn it up, turn it off, turn it down, shut the door, shut the fridge, shut your face. We try not to <laughs> ask your mom. I said no, what did I say? Say that again, I dare you. <laughs> clean your room, clean your plate, take a bath, go to bed, go to sleep, all right? Three words, that's all we get. And if you're a parent, you know what that's like, right? We haven't had a complete sentence in ages. And you start to wonder, is this making any difference? Right? Is the life that I live having any impact? And if you've ever been anywhere on that continuum, if you've even gotten close to, to the point George Bailey gets to, if you've gone down that bridge that he goes to, then I'm so glad that you're here today. Because the message that I want you to hear, and it's a message that we see in George Bailey's life, but more importantly, it's a message that we see in the scriptures. And it's this. Small decisions make a big difference. Small decisions make a big difference. And that's a good thing because most of the time, all we have are small decisions. But our small choices, they lead to big changes. Our little investments, they lead to a big impact. Your life makes a difference. It's significant. It matters. And I want you to see that from George's life, but more importantly, I want you to see that from the pages of Scripture. You know, we could look at the movie again, and we could look at a few key scenes in the movie where George has, has a decision to make, right? Should he stay in Bedford Falls, or should he go travel the world? Should he work at, at the business, at the, at the building and loan, or should he go off to college? Should he go on his honeymoon, or should he stick around town and help his neighbors and his friends, because there's a run on the bank, and people are all in a panic? And in each of those moments, if you're familiar with the movie, George Bailey makes a significant decision, And that decision makes a difference. But I don't really want to explore George's life. I want to take you to the life of one of the characters in the Christmas story. One of the characters who often seems forgotten. One of the characters who seems like an extra on the scene. But one of the characters who made a few significant choices that led to some huge changes. Someone whose small decisions made a big difference. I want to take you to to the story of Joseph. Mary's husband, Jesus' earthly father. And I want you to see three key moments in his life, three key decisions that he made that continue to echo through eternity. So if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 1. We'll just be looking at Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2, a few passages from the Christmas story. The, the words will be on the screen. They're also on the note sheet in your bulletin that you'll want to take home with you after today so that you can move through the app notes throughout the week. Matthew chapter 1, let's read about Joseph. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. You see, he's got this decision to make because the woman that he's about to marry is already pregnant. And so as far as he could tell, as far as anybody can tell, there's been some unfaithfulness here. And the law specifically said that he didn't have to go through with that marriage. In fact, the law said that someone like that could be stoned. And so Joseph wants to be faithful to the law, and yet he's a righteous man. He doesn't want to expose her to public disgrace, and so maybe he'll just divorce her quietly. Should he stick with Mary? Should he divorce her? Should he make a big deal about it? 
verse 20, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Skip down to verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do, and he took Mary home as his wife. And so here's the first decision that Joseph needs to make, and the decision that he makes makes a big difference. Let's scroll ahead in the story a little bit. Matthew chapter 2, after they, they stick together, they head on to Bethlehem, and Jesus is born. Not long after that, word gets out, and these magi, these wise men, these kings from the east come to visit. And after the magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod, the king, is going to search for the child to kill him. Verse 14, so Joseph got up, he took the child and his mother during the night, and he left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. So again, a critical moment, a decision needs to be made. Do we stay here in Bethlehem or do we flee to Egypt? And Joseph makes a small decision that has a big difference. Later, later on in Matthew chapter 2, after they've escaped to Egypt, now another decision, do we stay in Egypt or do we relocate again? Matthew 2, 19, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and he said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, he took the child and his mother and he went to the land of Israel but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. Three key moments in the life of Joseph. Does he stick with Mary or does he divorce her? And, and he decides to stick with Mary and have this child. Does he stay in Bethlehem or does he head to Egypt? And he decides to head to Egypt. Does he stay in Egypt or does he relocate back to their home country, their homeland of Israel? And he decides to do that. Three key decisions and each one having a dramatic impact, making an extreme difference. These are pretty much the only times we see Joseph in the Christmas story. Otherwise, like I said, he's a supporting character. He gets lost in the shadows sometimes. But he's the one who has to make these decisions on behalf of his family and those small decisions make a huge difference. Just imagine what would have happened if Joseph had chosen the other, the other option. Imagine what had happened if he decides not to marry Mary, if he, if he exposes her for the supposed adultery and unfaithfulness. Imagine what happens if he goes to great lengths and has her stoned. Imagine what happens if he continues on with Mary and then instead of escaping to Egypt, they stay in Bethlehem. And then Herod sends out the decree that all the baby boys under two years old are to be killed. What happens then? What happens if, if he continues to raise his family in Egypt, never, never bringing Jesus and his family even back to Israel, back to that nation? I mean, any one of these decisions, if they had gone the other way, history would be drastically different today. But these small decisions, these small choices, these seemingly insignificant moments echo on into the future. You see, small, small choices lead to big changes. Small decisions make a big difference. Now, if you're following along in the story, you're probably thinking, well, you know, obviously that's the case for Joseph, you know, and, and it was easy for him to make the right choice because if you're paying attention, he had his own version of Clarence, you know, showing up every now and then, right? He has a guardian angel stopping in on, on lonely nights to let him know what he should be doing next, right? Did you notice that throughout the passage? All three times, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Verse 13, uh, chapter 2, 13, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Later on in chapter 2, verse 19, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph. And so at these critical moments, Joseph gets a visit from heaven. And he gets some instruction and some direction, some counsel of what he should do. And thankfully, every time, Joseph follows that instruction. And so you're probably thinking, well, sure. You know, if I had that kind of access, I'd make a lot better choices too. 
If I had somebody visiting me, you know, even if it was Clarence, even if it was whatever angel, if I had somebody visiting me, I'd make some better choices as well. Well, before you talk too quickly, let me just take you to some words that Jesus offered to his followers before he left, right? Jesus, the one that was, that was uh, prophesied here to be Emmanuel, God with us, he comes on the scene at Christmas and he spends 30 years here, then he spends three more years with his disciples, you know, ministering to them, teaching them, helping them. And then he says to them, it's on the back of your note sheet in John 14, this is the night before Jesus is to be crucified. And he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to, keep, to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. You know him for he lives with you and will be in you. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you everything that I have said to you. So if Joseph were here, Joseph would say that we have it even better than he had it. In fact, that's the case Jesus is making, isn't it? Jesus was here with them. He was physically present with them. But now he says, it's going to get one better. When Jesus leaves, he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And those of us who are Jesus' followers... We don't just have God with us, we have God's spirit within us. We don't have to wait for an angel to show up in a dream. We have God's spirit dwelling within us 24-7. So don't tell me Joseph had it better. Joseph and Jesus would both say, we've got it better. We have the very spirit of God dwelling within us day by day, moment by moment. Every decision that you make could be directed by the spirit of God if we would just learn to listen and respond. Because what do we read later on in the scripture in James chapter 1? If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And so this same access that Joseph had, you and I have as well. See, our decisions make a difference, and so make the right decisions. Our choices are going to lead to big changes, so make wise choices. And that That's not always easy, but we always have access to God's Spirit. And if we were to spend the rest of our lives doing nothing more than learning how to listen to God's Spirit and obey His promptings, that would be a life well lived. That would be a wonderful life. And that is exactly why Jesus came. He came to be with us, and then He left His Spirit to be within us so that we would make wise choices, so that we would go on the right path, because the path we go down makes a difference. The choices we make will will have an impact. Our lives are not inconsequential. Our lives make a difference. I want you to see one more thing from Joseph's story. I want you to see the fact that Joseph had no idea what was at stake when he was making these decisions. He had no idea that at, at each of these forks in the road, ancient prophecies were being fulfilled. Let's go back to those same three passages, but I want to read some verses that I left out on the first swoop. Matthew chapter 1, 22. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and will give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The prophet Isaiah spoke those words hundreds of years before. And if Joseph had made the wrong choices, if Joseph hadn't followed the Spirit's promptings, those prophecies wouldn't have come true. Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. This is after Joseph takes his family from Bethlehem and flees to Egypt. And so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. And now he's quoting a prophet called Hosea, who hundreds of years earlier had said, out of Egypt, I called my son. And so again, Joseph's decisions fulfill an ancient prophecy. One more time, later on in Matthew 2, after Joseph relocates from Egypt back to Nazareth, verse 23, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Do you see what's happening? Joseph makes these decisions that literally are fulfilling ancient prophecies, and all the while, Joseph has no idea what hangs in the balance. He has no idea what's at stake when he's making these decisions and these choices. 
And yet God, the God of the universe, the God who inspired those prophecies, the God who's prompting him to make these decisions is at work doing something much larger than Joseph will ever understand. And don't forget this, the same is true for you. The God of the universe is at work. You may never know. Your life may seem insignificant and inconsequential, but it is not. The choices that you make make a difference. The decisions that you make matter. And you may have no idea what's at stake. But when you make the right choices, all of heaven applauds because you're continuing what God has at work. You're continuing down the path as his spirit leads you and as we respond to that, you have no idea what he's doing behind the scenes. That's how powerful your life is. Your words have an impact. Your actions send ripple effects. The choices that you make will lead to changes in the lives around you. You are making a difference for good or bad in your homes, at your schools, in your communities, at the places where you work, at the people you hang out with. Your life is making a difference one way or the other. And so again, if we could do nothing more than just listen to the Spirit of God, learn how to pay attention to that prompting, learn His Word, learn to listen to His Spirit, and then follow those promptings, you'll be amazed at how life opens up. You'll be amazed at the wonderful life that you really can have. You familiar with the phrase, the butterfly effect? There have been some science fiction movies about this. There's been uh, uh, some books written about this. Most recently, this one came out in 2010. Uh, but the butterfly effect goes back to 1963. A man named Edward Lawrence is at the, uh, the New York City Science Convention, the New York Academy of Sciences, rather. And he presents a theory there in New York uh, that, he, that goes on to be called the butterfly effect. And he says, isn't it possible that a butterfly could flap its wings and could, could move some air molecules, and those air molecules would move other air molecules, and those, in, in essence, would move other air molecules, and so on and so forth. And, and after that chain reaction, isn't it possible that that could have something to do with a hurricane on the other side of the world? And he literally was laughed out of the conference in 1963. Nobody thought that was possible. They laughed him off the stage. So imagine the scientific community's shock and surprise when more than 30 years after the possibility was introduced, physics professors working around the globe came to discover that this was true. This is authentic, accurate, and viable. Soon they, they actually named it a law, the law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. The butterfly effect is no joke. Everything that moves does affect the things around it. And our decisions do make a difference. And this isn't just true for butterflies, it's true for our lives as well. The words that we speak have an impact on the people around us. The choices that we make change things in the future. The way that we live has an impact, it matters. And in the book, they go on to say this, there are generations yet unborn whose very lives will be shifted and shaped by the moves you make and the actions you take today and tomorrow and the next day and the next. Everything you do matters. You have been created in order that you might make a difference. George Bailey learned that. I believe Joseph came to realize that that was true, and my hope is that you will also realize that you're no accident, and the choices that you make are not merely coincidence. The opportunities that God brings your way, the people that cross your path, you have no idea what hangs in the balance. And so in each moment, just please remember that your small choices lead to big changes. Your small decisions make a big difference. Let me just share with you one example right here from Parker Hill. You know that last week we, just, uh, we launched our Compassionate Christmas Campaign, which is an opportunity for us to provide gifts to local, local nonprofits that they will in turn pass on to families in the community. And as well as doing that here locally, we also have that, that one section where we're also buying livestock for our friends in Kenya and in Haiti. Right, just think of it as live stocking stuffers, if that helps, right? <laughs> Spreading the good moves this Christmas, okay? You're with me? But let me just tell you, we did this last year as well. We did goats for Godo. You remember that? We just focused it on Karagodo, Kenya, and we were able to provide goats and provide chickens and sheep and pigs and all that. I want to introduce you to some of the people that are living in Karagodo that were blessed by those goats. Teresa is a 67-year-old widow who takes care of her five orphaned school-age grandchildren. 
She's on a very limited income. Her, her really, her only options financially come through her roadside banana stand. Michael is 77 years old. He suffers with diabetes. His wife is 72. They don't have children to take care of them, so it's just the two of them trying to, trying to get enough money for food and for medication. Joyce. Joyce is 32 years old, a widow, a mother of four school-aged children, trying to support her family, trying to come up with money for food and for school fees. And last year at about this time, they realized that life was pretty hard. In fact, they realized that for a long time, trying to figure out how their life made any difference, trying to figure out how they were going to make it through another day. And then you came along, and you bought a goat, and they got a goat, and they received one of those goats from you. We, we, we gave the contributions, and their families were chosen by the leadership council to receive some of this assistance. And now, all of a sudden, they have, they have something that's giving them nutrient-rich milk. They have a way to, to a, a product that they can sell now. They also have free fertilizer for their gardens, right? Your small choice to be part of that made a life-changing difference in these three lives. And not just theirs, 36 others. Listen to this. Thank you, Parker Hill Community Church, for your $6,000 in contributions towards the Goats for Goto Livestock Project in December 2012. Your support provided 39 goats to some of the poorest individuals in our community. 11 additional goats were provided to a women's development group. 15 goat pens were built for families that didn't have the means to keep their goats secure. And all of these goats were provided through the local church in Karagoto. When you take one of those tags for the goats or for any of the others, that choice is not a neutral decision. That choice makes a difference. The way that you live, the way that you give, the way that you speak echoes into other people's lives. It has a butterfly effect. Your life matters. It makes a difference. Your small decisions have a big impact. Let me share another story. This one, not specifically from our church, but this is from a book that I read called, my wife's reading actually, called The Unexpected Adventure. And it's about a pastor who used to work in the newspaper. And he tells this story. He says, well, one average and routine day, I was packing my briefcase and getting ready to leave the newspaper. When I felt a gentle nudging of the Holy Spirit, and we talked about that, I sensed that God wanted me to go into the business office and invite my friend, who was an atheist, to come to Easter service at my church. Since the impression seemed so strong, I figured that something dramatic was going to happen. And, so, and, and, I, and it did, but not in the way that I had anticipated. I walked into the business office, and I looked around. The place was, appeared to be emptied, except for my friend, who was sitting at his desk. Perfect. I reminded him that Easter was coming, and I asked him if he would want to come to church with me and Leslie. He turned me down cold. I asked if he was interested at all in spiritual matters, and he emphatically said no. I talked to him about why the resurrection was so important, but it clearly, he clearly wasn't interested. With all of my evangelistic overtures being instantly shut down, I was beginning to get a little embarrassed. Why was he so disinterested in talking about spiritual matters if God was indeed prodding me to talk to him? Finally, I stammered, well, uh, if you've ever got any questions, um, I guess you know where my desk is. And I walked out. What was that about? I couldn't understand why he was so adamantly resistant. In the end, I concluded that maybe I was going to be one link in a very long chain of people and experiences that would eventually lead him to Christ. Still, as far as I know, he still remains skeptical to this day. Fast forward several years. By this time, I was a teaching pastor at Willow Creek Community Church in, a suburban, Chicago, in suburban Chicago. After I spoke one Sunday morning, a middle-aged man came up and shook my hand. He said, I just want to thank you for the spiritual influence you've had in my life. That's very nice, I said, but who are you? <laughs> Let me tell you my story, he replied. A few years ago, I lost my job. I didn't have any money, and I was afraid I was going to lose my house. I called a friend of mine who runs a newspaper, and I said, do you have any work for me? He asked, can you tile floors? Well, I had tiled my bathroom once, so I said, sure. He told me, we need some tiling done in the newspaper. If you can do that, I can pay you. So one day, not long before Easter, I was on my hands and knees behind a desk in the business office of the newspaper, fixing some tiles, when you walked into the room. 
You didn't even know I was there. You started talking about God and Jesus and Easter and the church to some other guy. He was not interested at all. But I was crouching there listening and my heart was beating out of my chest and I'm thinking, I need God. I need to go to church. As soon as you left, I called my wife and I said, we're going to church this Easter. She said, you're kidding. I said, no, we are. We ended up coming to this church that Easter. My wife, my teenage son, and I all came to faith in Christ and I just wanted to thank you. I was dumbstruck. Who could have foreseen that except the amazing God of grace? You have no idea what hangs in the balance. You have no idea what's at stake when you have the opportunity to extend an invitation, when you have the opportunity to buy a gift, when you have the opportunity to show kindness or forgiveness or grace. You have no idea that your small decision can make a big impact, can make a big difference. Your small choices lead to big changes. Your small investments lead to big impact. So please don't underestimate what could happen if you walk down the street and invite a friend to our Christmas celebration. Who knows, maybe the plumber will come instead, I don't know. Who knows what could happen when you decide to to serve in our community to join the board of that organization or to start volunteering at that nonprofit. Who knows what hangs in the balance? Who knows what could happen? Only God knows what could happen when you start to serve here at Parker Hill, when you decide to host a small group in your house, or you decide to join our guest services team. Who knows who you might be able to greet when they finally decide to come back to church? Only God knows the impact that could come when you start to serve in our children's ministry and you decide to take care of some babies for those new moms, or you decide to lead a small group of elementary age kids. Who knows what impact you could have on a middle schooler or high schooler when you decide to serve at Quake or at Velocity. Only God knows the impact that our seemingly insignificant lives can have for all of eternity. Because this is the point, your lives are not insignificant. Your life is not immaterial. It matters. It makes a difference. Everything you do will ripple into the future and will touch lives. So make wise choices. Listen to God's prompting. Obey his spirit. Walk across that room. Go down the street. Go down the the, the hall. Do what God's prompting you to do because those small decisions make a big difference. You have no idea what's at stake and what lives you're touching and what God is doing behind the scenes. So please don't think that your life is insignificant. It matters in ways that you may never know. And as we move into this season with plenty of opportunities to serve others, plenty of opportunities to give generously, plenty of opportunities to share an invitation of God's love, don't ever underestimate what God may be doing through your seemingly insignificant life because your small decisions make a big difference. I want you to see one more scene from It's a Wonderful Life. I want you to see the final scene of the movie where George gets his life back and and he begins to see the lives that he has touched and the difference that he's made in that community. And as, as you watch this last clip, I want you to think of your own life. And I want you to think of the investments that you can make in the people around you. I want you to think how you can show love and grace, how you can offer forgiveness, how you can give generously, how you can speak kindly, I want you to think of all the seemingly insignificant things that you could do that will make a difference, a difference that you may never know. So take a look at George Bailey and remember this, your one life truly could be a wonderful life.